Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Infinite Leaders Live. My name is Lewis Keynes and our why is simple, uh, to be better educators and to be better humans. We want to support and encourage infinite learning regardless of role, rank or responsibility in whatever walk of life or job you find yourself or others in. We want people to be willing to listen, to learn and to share. I'm joined in the desert by my pal Alan and that top looks nice. Alan, I've got one similar myself. Yeah, Lewis, we're looking fresh and uh, I'd like to thank... Our sponsors at Tsunami for giving us some apparel. Really nice stuff. So thank you to Andrew Chambers. And he's going to be coming on the show in a few weeks' time. So we'll continue to focus on the things you don't get taught at university or on any courses. Real-life lessons from real-life people with real-life experience. Sponsors makes us sound big time. We've we've not forgot our roots, don't (laughs) worry. We're not really sponsored. It's just a free T-shirt. But we are incredibly appreciative (laughs) and we're looking forward to... uh, to having a chat with Andrew. And if you've listened to Infinite Leaders Live before, you know we're learning as we go and that's everything that we're about. We record live and there'll be a few mistakes along the way, more from us than our guests usually. But we love your feedback, so please do get in touch, um, whether you have something constructive or some praise to share with us, we'd love to hear it. You can find us on Instagram, YouTube, IG, uh, so IGTV is Instagram, isn't it? Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and theinfinitelearners.com. So, Let's sit back, listen, learn, and share. Alan, should we get cracking? Yeah, get your pens and papers ready, guys. There's going to be some absolute gems of wisdom coming out of the show today. Uh, Cindy Adair is the Assistant Principal and Athletics Director at Bangkok Patna School in Thailand. As a member of the academic leadership team, Cindy is responsible for an extracurricular programme of over 500 activities a week and a large and vibrant seasonal sports programme. Cindy has previously worked at the Australian Institute of Sport and has a master's degree in education. So Cindy, welcome to the show. Great to have you on. Thank you guys, thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Let's start right back at the beginning, Cindy. Tell us a bit about your childhood and and the people who influence the values you have today. Um, Yep, so I am a uh, child of two Kiwis who uh, were from New Zealand, but um, quite early on, Uh, in their marriage moved to Australia so my brother and I are Aussie passport holders but uh, parents of Kiwis so the when the All Blacks play the Wallabies it's always an interesting day at our house. (laughs) Um, I grew up in a little town called Avalon in the northern beaches of Sydney Um, and I think the people who influenced me the most were definitely mum and dad. I was lucky I had a a kind of idyllic childhood, lots of um, you know sport weekends at the beach um and uh my mum and dad were just really good solid hard-working people they ran their own business and the computer industry they got into computers really early on when they were the size of a room so I remember going and working at my dad's uh uh office stuffing envelopes and uh yeah he had the big IBM one of the first big IBM computers that would fill up a whole room um so Um, My dad was really a very hard worker and quite a visionary and liked to get into a bit of an entrepreneur. And um, my mum was there beside him every step of the way. Um, Really sporty family. We're into everything. Um, Sunday for us was usually mum and dad working as lifeguards down at um, the Avalon Beach and us sort of kicking around, probably getting far too sunburnt, uh, like all kids of the 80s did. (laughs) Um, Yeah, just really kind of idyllic lovely childhood um when I finished primary school we actually moved back to New Zealand and I did high school um at Mount Aspiring College in Wanaka which is a really beautiful part of the world lakes and mountains and skiing and that kind of thing um and again just sport was a really big part of my childhood it was what gave me lots of really good life lessons and some lifelong friends um coaches that I had through that time and teachers were really positive influence and I think that that kind of led me down that path of where I am today. So you obviously really enjoyed sport as a youngster Cindy and and tell us about the journey how did you end up going from this idyllic place in in New Zealand with so much outdoor living to the uh, the smoke and smog of Bangkok? Tell us in with what happened between those two things. Yeah so there were a few steps so uh, when I finished school in New Zealand um, I actually had originally enrolled to study medicine in at Otago Uni just down the road from Wanaka Um, and I went on a holiday to kind of celebrate the end of my uh, uh, high school with my parents and I was in Sydney airport we were on our way to Bali 
and I picked up a book and it was called Smart Sport. And uh, I, I, I was enrolled in this medical course, but I, I don't really like blood and I don't really like, um, uh, you know, seeing anything gory. So there was some, like a little part in the back of my head going, I'm not really sure this is the right thing for you, Cindy. But anyway, you got good grades. You should do it. Off you go. So I'm at the airport in Sydney and I pick up this book and it's got a chapter on like athletic recovery written by a lady called Angie Calder. Um, and Angie Calder is like a guru in the field of recovery and contrast hydrotherapy and all those interesting things. And I see under her name that she's got Bachelor of Applied Science in Sports Coaching, University of Canberra. So I call up my dad on this payphone from Sydney Airport. I'm really showing my age here, payphone. Um, and I said to him, I found the course. I found what I should be doing. Can you get me a prospectus? And then I went off to Bali and had a lovely time. Uh, came back and my, on my bedroom, on my bed was the prospectus for Canberra Uni. Um, and my dad and I cashed in some air points from a building project. He'd now changed from being an entrepreneur in the computer industry to a, a property developer, um, which would be many reincarnations of his work. Um, and we flew to Canberra for two days. Uh, chatted to the course director, got a late application in and um, Bob's your uncle. I started studying coaching science um, and the University of Canberra have a really close relationship with the Australian Institute of Sport. So awesome kind of think tank town to be in when you're really passionate about sports, exercise science and all of that sort of thing. Um, I got a part-time job at the Institute of Sport um, within a couple of months sort of starting just uh, teaching swimming and running tours of the campus um, in their kind of commercial wing. Um, and then when I finished my degree, I actually ended up working there for eight years in total, um, doing all sorts of roles. And, I, and the, the really funny part was I ended up flatting with Angie Calder's daughter, Katie Calder. <laughs> I met her through a friend, a cross country skier. And she said, I've got another friend who cross country skis. She needs a place to live. And then it turned out it was Angie's daughter. And my second year, lecturer was Angie's husband who was an all blacks biomechanist so it was all one of those very weird little fate type things that I think was meant to be so stayed in Canberra for eight years um, and then a friend and I won a competition uh, it was through a group called STA travel uh, to uh, do some outreach work uh, we had to write a proposal so I said to her I really want to go to a tropical island. What kind of problems do people have in tropical islands? It's horrendous. <laughs> um, and so she was in health promotions and she said, oh, there's lots of, um, you know, lifestyle related illnesses. And I said, well, my thing's swimming and yours is health promotion. Let's write a bit of a proposal. And anyway, we won this grant from STA Travel and we ended up traveling to the Fiji Islands. Um, and we got some support from our workplace as well, who had a kind of program where you could salary sacrifice some of your holidays to um, fund these things. And off we went to Fiji and we ran this water safety program in Fiji and uh, uh, ended up, you know, one too many drinks, I think at the side of the pool one night and met the love of my life, my husband, um, Carlos, who's a, a you know, Fijian uh, lad. And uh, then after a year or so, or so uh, we got engaged and he said, uh, and I said to him, oh, I'm not going to marry you until I've lived with you because I might be a nightmare or you might be a nightmare. Um, <laughs> turned out both were true. Um, <laughs> and uh, so he was either going to have to come live in Australia. I was going to come live in Fiji. So I got in touch with Fiji Swimming, who I'd been doing that, that aid project with back in the day with my friend and said, you know, I'm engaged and I'm keen to come. Have you got any work for me? And they were amazing. They kind of cobbled together this job for me running Fiji Swimming. I was the first kind of official employee they'd ever had um, and I was paid cobbled together a bunch of different bits of aid money and grants and a bit of sponsorship and um, and off I went to Fiji so um, I ran Fiji swimming for a couple of years and that was a awesome wild adventure <laughs> um, they'd never had an employee before so they were just happy for me to run with it I set up a national camp structure and got to write a uh, an education coach education program uh, put in place a Grand Prix series so kids could compete more um, just really fun creative crazy time 
Um, there's no money in it, but we were young and in love. We didn't need any money. <laughs> so it was a little bit crazy. Um, really, really fun time. Met some amazing people. And, um, you know, obviously in the process, got married and um, really got to know Fijian culture, which was fantastic. And I, and I definitely credit that for why I'm still happily married to my husband now, because we truly understand each other, I guess. Um, and then unfortunately, Fiji had uh, a, a political coup that was quite um, quite interesting time for us. So uh, as a sort of mixed race couple, things got a little bit dangerous in the areas where we lived. And uh, someone uh, was killed just around the corner from where we lived. And that was kind of a bit of a catalyst for us to go, hey, this is not working right now. Let's try and go somewhere else. So I uh, got online as you do and uh, looked up jobs. And uh, on the Australian swimming website, uh, Bangkok Partner were advertising for a head of aquatics. Um, and so I applied having never been to Thailand. I didn't know Bangkok Partner School. I didn't even really know that there was an international school circuit. I was just looking to get out of Dodge as fast as I could. <laughs> um, and I literally, my husband had only ever been on a plane once before in our lives. And uh, we had, I think I remember uh, 700 Fijian dollars to our name, uh, two suitcases. And we jumped on a plane and came to Thailand. And uh, luckily we chose partner and not some other you know, dodgy school in a cupboard. It turned out to be this amazing, wonderful journey. Um, but yeah, it, it was pure luck. I'd like to say I'd chosen it strategically and it was part of my career plan, but that wouldn't be the truth. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> what a story I, that is. I, draw breath more often, I, feel, I, feel, I feel my story is really boring now. I'm, yeah. not, I'm, I'm just going to go. <laughs> <laughs> That, that, is, that is amazing, Cindy. I love that journey. Absolutely love it. And just the fact that you just get on a plane with two suitcases and you get into Thailand. So just, just going back a step or two there then. So from all that experience, what values did you really form from that? Um, I think being courageous and brave. You've got to take, yeah. take your moments in life. So, um, and just trust and go with it. Um, I like to play that game in my head with myself. Like what's the worst thing that could happen here? It's usually not too bad. So you may as well go for it. Um, I think also just being really genuine and hardworking. Hard work translates in every country of the world. Um, and just be passionate and keep, keep chasing. Um, I think flexibility is really important. Uh, and I think that's what I kind of got from my dad. So I watched him you know, be a, an entrepreneur in the computer um, business. Then I watched him move into property development. He coached our first 15 when my brother played rugby. Um, then he got into swim coaching himself. And, um, you know, he, the, and I think that sort of transferable skills and a flexible approach to life can take you a really long way. And it also gives you that kind of courage to jump if you know that your skills can can transfer in many different ways. I think you picked a really nice, nice mix of values there. I think maybe you're doing yourself a disservice by saying you're lucky and it was, <laughs> it was, it was timing because, you know, there is that, that side of looking at it, isn't there, that you, there was a military coup, which you couldn't have predicted that forced you to leave the country, which you wouldn't have predicted. And then you ended up finding a job on a website, which you couldn't have predicted, but there was a series of things before that, that put you in a position to be able to apply for that job and that gave you the experience and that gave you the skills to be able to go and seize that moment. And, and, and it's really interesting you hear in talking about your dad, tell me, tell me what those skills were that your dad had that, that you feel that you've got in common and how those have helped. Um, well, we're both highly organized, almost, uh, Anally retentively, so I'm allowed to say that on your podcast. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows that. Um, so there's no hiding that. Um, yeah, really organized, very goal oriented and focused. Um, super stubborn, never give up, that kind of thing. But also always kind of searching. What's the next thing look like? What's what's innovative? What's new? What could we try? Never kind of satisfied with sitting with the status quo. So yeah. So that sounds it, it's like interesting, that. yeah. It, I, what I like there, Cindy, is that um, your dad was 
was changing careers at a point where I'm, I'm a similar age to you, where you just, it, our dads and a mum, you just had one career, it was fixed. You, you start in a company, and I know Lewis's dad did 40 odd years in the steelworks. You had your career and you stuck with it. And it seems that your dad had a plan that's now in apparent in, in today's world where you have them transferable skills and you apply them to different contexts. Would you agree on that? Yeah, no, he's definitely a bit ahead of his time because, you know, they say now you're going to have seven or eight careers, don't they? And certainly the yeah. kids we're teaching now in our schools, it's all about transferable skills. Um, yeah, so I guess he, he was and um, he just, you know, life kind of threw at him what it did and he was able to kind of pivot and keep going, which is the word I keep hearing in the media all the time. We've all got to learn to pivot. <laughs> yeah, we love a pivot, don't we? It's a, it's a fundamental yeah. skill in more way than one. <laughs> Um, to tell us a little bit about that that sort of want for for searching for something. You use that word searching. Now, um, yeah, I think you know everyone's got something that drives them. Um, I'm I'm a real dork. I'm always reading. I'm always kind of researching. I listen to podcasts. You know, probably six or seven podcasts a week religiously. Um, wow. And I just um, I don't know. I think I, I need I need that to feed my soul. I'm not really one of those people who can sit around and, and, and I'm not very good at just doing nothing. Um, and I like to be feeling like I'm moving forward um, and feeling like I'm pushing the envelope and finding new and interesting ways to do things or just think about things, I guess. So tell us what else energizes you and saps you. What really gives you the, the energy to, to go on and, and enjoy your day and, and what really takes that away? Um, what gives me energy? Uh, I love like that connection with other people. So chatting with colleagues and going out. I mean, I uh, love working with children. Children give me energy. And in fact, if I am having a down day where I'm stuck behind the, the laptop as sometimes happens in the AD role and I've been cranking through the emails for how many hours, um, reminding myself to get out of my chair and go and see some kids, watch some sport, see some activities, um, gives me lots of energy. Um, I obviously, my main sports were kind of aquatics related and, and netball, um, but I still love di diving in the pool, cranking out some laps. They're a lot slower laps than they used to be, but no. there's something about just that Zen world of going up and down that black line, kind of a form <laughs> of meditation, I guess, <laughs> that I really, I really enjoy. Um, but yeah, reading, listening to podcasts, hanging out with colleagues and friends. Um, yeah, I think they're the main things. And what's on the flip side? What, what really drains you? <sighs> oh, what really drains me? Um, I'm, I'm a real optimist, if I'm honest. It's not because I'm, and I'm quite upbeat. So things that drain me are, you know, if you're dealing with a difficult situation at work or someone's not being quite straight with you or showing a lack of integrity or, you know, you've had one of those days where things just haven't gone your way or you haven't been able to tear yourself away from the laptop and the emails and the kind of drudgery of it. Um, but I do bounce back quick. I think that's one of the things about me that I don't, I don't wallow too much. Yeah, you don't feel sorry for yourself. There's a bit of bounce back ability. Try not to. Try nice. not to. Nice. <laughs> the, the, I want to move on a little bit, but but in that same kind of vein, through the energizers versus the sort of sappers, um, there's a certainly an understanding with within directors of sport and ads that the the a work life balance struggles to exist to a certain extent, and and I liken it a little bit to the the fact that it isn't a work life balance; it's more of an energizer and sapper balance, and that actually your work and your life do intermix and do intermingle, maybe not so much at the moment, but, but in the usual term when things are up and running in the way that they are. And separating work and life is sometimes quite difficult and there's a lot of overlap, but separating those um, sapping moments and finding the energizers is really good. Now you touched on it earlier about, you know, if you're having a day behind a laptop that isn't going well, you, you're going to go out and you're going to try and look at some sport or, or see some children active and playing. What do you do on those really tough days, on those days where you're having one of those, you know, you're having a bit of a stinker, you're not feeling right. How, how do you keep yourself on an even keel and give yourself that energy when, when things are on top? Um, so a couple of things. I mean, I, I try, I've 
recently I've tried really hard to like make sure that exercise is still part of my day. So I get up early and I've been, uh, I've got a little bit obsessed with these like virtual cycling and uh, walking challenges and stuff. I think it's that what COVID's done to me. So I, I make sure that I need, you know, 20, 30 minutes, it's not much, but just preload the day with a bit of exercise. Um, and then if I am having one of those days, one of my sort of key mentors at my current role said to me that his dad had given him a great piece of advice that if you're ever having a super tough day um, to sit down and send out three pieces of praise to different colleagues or students or send home a really nice message about a kid who's you know really made a bit of improvement and so I do try and do that and it does make such a difference because actually sitting down and trying and you know purposely thinking of three really positive lovely things putting them into words and sending them off is such a like a little switch I think and it kind of gets you back oh there is good stuff going on here we are in a good place and I think also it's about surrounding yourself with good people having good sounding boards that you can just sort of say oh have a rant have a rave you know and then grab a coffee and keep going yeah, I That's, think that those sounding boards uh, resonate, don't they? You know, you, you've got to have that kind of release and, and somebody to chat to. I know you've done a, a lot of work and, and you still are, Cindy, with, with mental health and, and, and how to support yourself and other people. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so it's an area that I'm really um, passionate about and interested in. Um, as you sort of said in the way back in the intro, um, I've been working on my master's for the last few years. Um, and one of the topics I got right into was looking at work-life balance and mental health for um, athletic directors um, specifically, but obviously leaders in international schools more generally. Um, and some of the key themes are, you know, self-care, making sure that, you know, we're often the people who preach health, fitness, wellness, but we don't necessarily do it ourselves. Um, so simple stuff drink water, exercise every day, take some time out, do some stretches, you know, we're not get some sleep, that kind of stuff. Um, so making sure that we, we do the simple stuff. Um, I think also uh, looking at what's genuinely possible with the number of personnel you have in your athletic departments. So um, I think that the, the era of a kind of one man band, uh, also teaching PE all day, also coaching every team every weekend is, is sort of maybe outgrown its youth now. Um, and a lot of schools are recognizing that and kind of diversifying their athletic and activities departments. Um, and it was interesting, I did some research throughout the Southeast Asia region and you can definitely see that the leading schools are on that journey. You know, they've, they've now got an athletics director, but often also an activities director because those roles are different and differentiated. They've got, they're bringing in specialist heads of swimming, heads of gymnastics, heads of tennis, heads of basketball, because they're recognizing that to take the students to the level that we all aspire to, it takes that specialist knowledge. Um, and so that then contributes to the athletic director's well-being, but it also changes their role a bit. Um, so if you are a person who likes to be super hands-on, you do end up managing your coaches more than you manage student athletes, which is a shift and something you have to adapt to. And it's something some people, as you say, get energy from and other people would probably feel sapped of energy from. So it's an interesting shift that's happening over time. And it's been quite a journey with, with that from, from where you might have been, you know, seven ten years ago in the region before a director of sport was a role and, and where maybe a, a head of PE was expected to do both of those yeah absolutely I, I just want to come back Cindy to this work-life balance I, I was I was listening to a podcast just this week with Eddie Hearn I don't know if you, you might have you might have listened to it on the high performance podcast and Eddie Hearn's a boxing promoter and he his dad uh, was a famous boxing promoter as well, and he's took over the business, and he's got Anthony Joshua and all these famous fighters. And he, he dismisses the term work-life balance because he thinks if you're passionate and you're doing something you love, it's not work. 
how what did your research show about that? Did anything come up about that? Because I I honestly thought when I was working with Lewis and the team in Manila, it didn't feel like work because I absolutely love going into work every day. And I didn't mind my weekends being took up because my kids were there. And and it was just my passion and it was unbelievable feeling. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think that um, with the right support, you can put it that way. And it's about putting those things in place. I mean, uh, uh, when I had been a, a, the head of aquatics at Patna for eight years, I actually stepped away from Patna and went back to my home country, which at that time was Australia, um, and had a year out before coming back to Patna to take up the um, sort of athletic director assistant principalship role. And um, one of the things that uh, I sort of, one of the reasons for going back to Australia, among other things, including my husband's need to get his permanent visa and things like that was, you know, I wanted the middle-aged dream. I wanted the dog and the backyard and the trampoline and the barbecue, and I wanted my weekends back. And so <laughs> off I went to Australia and, uh, you know, I got, I got all that. It was really nice, but then I was, I was quite bored on the weekends after a while. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. uh, I, I was working at a place uh, that was great, but it was much more of a clock in, clock out culture than I'd been used to. Um, and it wasn't a vocation. It was a job. Uh, and I soon started to crave uh, my sort of old international school life where you say till the job's done. And as you say, your kids are part of it. And uh, it's, it's a lifestyle. So for me, that is my happy place. And I think it's about, so I had a really, you know, great conversation with my husband. And I said, let's go back international, but let's not put our middle-aged dreams on hold. Let's go back to international school and get the trampoline and the dog and the house instead of a condo and, you know, get a barbecue. And, you know, this time you're not going to work and I'm going to work. And that was a key decision for us. So my husband uh, is, a, is a stay-at-home dad. Um, and that really works for us. Um, we share the load and he does all sorts of amazing stuff with my daughter and um, it just works. And so I don't have to have anywhere near as many worries about work-life balance because as a whole, we've sort of seen the other side and I don't think the grass is greener. <laughs> and yeah. then we put in place those kind of, I don't know, support networks for ourselves that make it work. That's really interesting yeah. about that phrase, grass is greener. You know, you, you've spent eight years probably having a similar conversation year after year with your husband. I'm, I'm being presumptuous here, no, of no, course, no. But, but year after year, and you're thinking, oh, we, we could, maybe we should, maybe we could, maybe we should. And then to go and do it and then find it isn't everything that you thought. You know, I'm sure there'll be people listening to this that, that are considering some, some kind of move or some kind of change. What, what, what would you have done differently to, to have a, a sort of a better insight into what that change would have been like for you? Do you, I, I maybe it won't go as far as asking whether you regret going back to Australia, but what, what would have helped you see that a little bit earlier or, or prevented that, maybe that move that you feel now maybe wasn't as necessary as, as you thought? Yeah, um, look, we thought long and hard and we really uh, were ready to repatriate and uh, it caught us, as unawares as, as any, anyone, that we weren't super happy when we got back there. Um, and so, I'd, and actually now in retrospect, it's the best thing that could have happened to us. I mean, if you've worked in international schools for a long time, and I'm as guilty of this as the next person, you do, because of the contract cycle, talk about who's leaving and who's going more than you ever have before in any other <laughs> workplace, right? You know, and especially now, like everyone's thick as thieves with it. Who's going? Did you hear? Uh, who's coming? <laughs> oh, when are they? When do they? When do they have to say all of that stuff? And um, to actually go home and really have that experience of comparing lifestyle, comparing, um, you know, where how you know how far your money can go, how much you're able to save, what your leisure time looks like. Um, and we love Australia. I mean, the parks and the beaches and the weather are to die for. But if you're only going to the park because you can't afford to go anywhere else <laughs> and the only holiday you're ever going to take is in a caravan down the road, um, then you are sort of, you, you do reconsider what your options are. And it was the healthiest thing we've ever done um, to actually have that living experiment. And luckily, you know, we fell on our feet. We got a good job offer. 
came back to a place we loved. But yeah. it's brilliant because now when all that intrigue comes up, especially at this time of year, we're not flip-flopping back and forth. We kind of know where we want to be. And that, that doesn't necessarily be it'll be Thailand forever, but for now, it really meets our needs as a family. I'm interested there, Cindy. I, I've got twins at 11 who've, obviously, they, they were born in Qatar. We moved to the Philippines. They've just left everything, their best friends, everything behind in the Philippines to move to, to Saudi. How did your kids then respond to, obviously, being in Bangkok, then going back to Australia for a year, and then coming back to, to Bangkok again? How did, how did they react? What were their thoughts on this process? Yeah, so um, I've got a daughter, and she was uh, five or six, I think, when we went back. And kids are wonderfully resilient. So yeah. um, off she went to Australia. It's going to be great. I'm going to spend more time with uncles and aunties and grandmas and granddads. And look, there's a beach and that kind of thing. Um, she uh, went to a sort of state school in Australia. Very good um, in terms of basic academics. She didn't struggle at all and made some lovely friends. But obviously no ECAs after school, no... Uh, swimming pools and uh, uh, gymnastics halls and things were abounding at this school. So that was an adjustment for her. Um, and then when she came back, she slotted in kind of like she'd never left. And that's the amazing thing about kids. Um, I think academically, she obviously transitioning between different school systems is always a challenge. So there was like little dips in each direction in terms of trying to adjust to the different ways they teach phonics and numeracy and things like that but I don't think we've done any lifelong damage but uh you never know you're just trying not to stuff your kids up right <laughs> <laughs> I, I just it blows me away the the flexibility and adaptability of kids particularly through this this time as well and just talk to a bit there about how you think that, that this COVID crisis as we've called it how do you think that's affected the education of kids or do you think it's actually been a positive um, I think the experience has been really different for different children. Um, I think that the work that teachers have done to turn their practice and pedagogy on its head with no notice um, and deliver in all these amazing innovative online ways has been absolutely awesome. And I watched, you know, my, my child and her friends and what they were doing online and it was awesome. But I think you've also got to acknowledge that there were kids stuck at home where both parents were trying to work or um, you know, people were suffering from poorer mental health because of job losses and all of that sort of stuff. So it's hard to make generalizations, but look, it's gonna make them resilient. It's gonna make them tough. It's gonna to give them an awesome story to tell their grandkids. <laughs> Remember the, the pandemic of 2020, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we've had the same conversation, Cindy, with our kids, and we say, well, what have you actually, what have you gained from this? And they, they usually use that word resilience. I mean, in terms of, in terms of values and, and trying to teach values, that's probably one of the highest ranking words at the moment. Um, could you give us a little bit more on that? How, how do you think resilience has been developed during this time and how we can do it as teachers? Oh, I mean, it's so tough, isn't it? Because that idea of developing resilience and grit, I guess the first thing is you've got to have really strong relationships and you've got to have trust with your kids because you can't put them to the test and help them to sort of develop resilience and grit until they truly trust you and they're willing to work hard for you and put themselves through kind of pain and discomfort as they go further in their learning or work out harder or run faster than they've ever run before. So I think you have to really develop trust in relationships first. And then um, with kids, kids, will, kids will go to the end of the earth for a teacher that they love. Um, so great relationships. Then I think we've just, we've got to be challenging kids and we've got to make it okay for them to fail. Um, and that's really hard because it's not something that um, is an easy sell, you know. Uh, there's lots of instant gratification in their worlds these days and failure is not something that's particularly celebrated, but you've got to make making mistakes really safe um, and then celebrate sort of progress as well as achievement, um, because obviously what you what you celebrate is what 
what you're really reinforcing. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm talking in kind of cliches there, but... <laughs> Cindy, <laughs> yeah, tell, us, t- tell us how you do that. So, you know, for, for those people listening that aren't um, familiar with Bangkok Pattern of School, huge school, you know, arguably the biggest and most successful sporting school in Bangkok, one of the biggest and, and most successful in, in Southeast Asia. And the children may... Um, certainly as they get older, feel that pressure uh, and yeah. know that they're the favourites going into tournaments and know that other schools are really looking forward to playing this big school from Bangkok. How do you make, how do you create an atmosphere and an environment where they feel that it's okay to fail? They might not want to, but but it is okay to, to get things wrong, to make mistakes, not to win and not to um, not to be successful in, in very gross and raw position terms. Yeah, look, I think that um, we've got some amazing coaches so we do lots of um, sort of briefings and CPL with our coaches to help them to um, set up uh, goals within their teams that are not just outcome related, but are progress related. Um, and making sure that when we set up uh, calendars and fixtures for our teams, we're not just playing, uh, we, we play a range of opponents. So we want a couple of games that are, you know, good wins that can boost confidence. We want a couple of games that are are highly competitive. And then we want a couple of games that are a stretch uh, and that we will lose. Um, And we go into each of those games uh, with a set of goals that we want to achieve. Um, And then also we do a lot of work with our students to try and develop their sort of leadership skills. So we have an athletic council um, and we, we meet with our captains and run a, a seasonal captain's lunch. And what we're trying to do with that group is talk to them about, you know, a values-driven program, uh, including all of their teammates, uh, being great sports, whether they're winning or losing, and just to cry, try and create this real culture where uh, excellence is not just winning a trophy at the end of the tournament, Excellence is something that has to be there in every training session, at every fixture that we win or lose. And then hopefully that kind of momentum will build and off we go to the tournament as not only better athletes, but but better people. Um, and we try to make sure that that's being led by the students themselves because we can talk and talk, but we're the boring old people. But it's very powerful when the peers are saying to each other, hey, this is our expectations or this is how we do it here or this is what's expected. And they set the tone and the work ethic and they kind of set the tone when we lose about how we behave and when we win, how, how we're gracious. And I imagine Bangkok Patina hasn't always had that ethos of, of it's okay to fail, it's okay not to win. Uh, you know, I, you, I, I'm, I'm not sure of the time scale, but I'm sure if we go back five, ten 12, 15 years, there, there might have been more of a, an emphasis on winning. Yeah, look, Were you part of, of how that changed and, and how did that change in your time at swimming there and how has that developed over the, the last three or four um, years? I mean, I'd like, to, I'd like to think I am, but it's definitely been a team effort. Um, and, you know, we love the win as, as much of it as anyone else. So it, it's not that we're not going for excellence. We really are. But... Um, Ultimately, we're running school-based athletics. We're not running an institute of sport. And most of our kids will graduate and hopefully, you know, go on to play a bit of sport at uni and then be lifelong active people. Um, There may be a small percentage who are elite enough to go on to achieve, you know, amazing things in sport. But ultimately, them being good people and being successful, resilient people who can cope with life's ups and downs is going to be a lot more important and a lot more valuable to them than, you know, that that time we won CSAC in 20, 2016 or something. So um, trying to get those things to have as equal weight as going for the win has been something that I'm trying to work on. I love that that quote there of it. You know, we're doing school sport, not an institute of yeah. sport. I think I think that's worth remembering for anybody working in a school sport department or PE department, isn't it? It certainly is. But yeah, I'd like to come back to those. You've just come full circle on transferable skills there. Going back to what your dad was doing, and then applying it back to the kids actually having a transferable skills. So, what do you think they're up there with the key transferable skills for what what sport can give kids? 
Um, oh, you know, I'm such a believer in the power of sport. So sport, I mean, my background's aquatics and it always amazes me how many of the, the swimmers are also the high achievers in the classroom. And I truly believe that, and that's, you know, and now that I'm more involved more broadly, that's not something that's special to swimming. It's something that applies to really good athletes across all sports. And I think it's because to dedicate yourself to something without knowing the outcome is, um, it takes courage and it takes sort of commitment. Um, so those kids tend to be the ones who've got a bit of stickability about them. So they're the ones who'll finish their uni degree and they're the ones who'll work their way up from the bottom when they get their first job. And that will help them enormously to be successful. I think that sporty kids are organized because they have to have time management skills. They have to pack the three bags because they know that they've got PE, then they've got football practice after school or tennis lesson or whatever it is that they're passionate about. Um, kids who've been exposed to teams have great interpersonal skills and some of them go on to be great leaders. Um, there's just so many things that you can take away from sport, you know, being able to win graciously, lose graciously, you know, work hard for a goal and achieve it and feel that buzz. Um, and equally, you know, work hard for a goal and not achieve it and then still rock up for training the next week. So I'm a huge believer in the power of sport to give people great personal skills. And I know you were telling us off air, you know, huge congratulations for the numbers that you're getting at the moment at Bangkok Patana. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what might have spiked those numbers so much? Yeah, look, we've been really pleasantly surprised. So just like everyone, we had um, a COVID lockdown that sort of began in March and uh, for us stretched through until June, which is, we were very fortunate. Um, Thailand's done a great job of managing COVID-19 thus far and long may that continue. Um, so we were able to get back to school for two weeks before the end of the last academic year, um, but that didn't involve a lot of PE and physical activity. That was very controlled um, and it was on a 50-50 model. But when we came back to school this academic year, we were lucky enough that things had settled to the point that we could begin uh, full PE lessons and local sport and some community sport. And the kids have come out in droves because I think they really missed not only um, physical activity, but they miss their friends. They miss their coaches, that social connection, um, being fit and healthy um, again and moving and enjoying time uh, outside of the classroom. And uh, it's been fantastic. There's been a real sort of swell of interest in getting involved and um, being active, which is great. Can I take it back to when you said you're like a, a bit of a dork, I think you were your own words, Cindy. Uh, true, true. <laughs> we, we like to think of as a bit of a geeks ourselves, but yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll go with dork in your terms. Um, what are you what are you reading at the moment that's really making you better, or what you're listening to? Anything that you're doing? Give us get, give the listeners some some real good gems. Um, I'm, I've been reading. I, I watched um, Brené Brown on Netflix. Her special. So I've been right into her at the moment. I've been reading her Dare to Lead um, book recently. I really, um, I had watched a long time ago, her kind of little short film on the difference between empathy and sympathy. So I was kind of drawn to her um, and some of her leadership books are great. And her main sort of theme is around brave and honest dialogue. And I think as a, a, a leader in an international school or really in any context, if you're really gonna bring out the best in your people, you need to have brave and honest dialogue. You need to be able to give honest feedback. You need to be able to receive honest feedback um, and you need to tackle things front on. So I really love her work. Um, she's also one, she has a great sort of chapter about making sure that you only take feedback from people who are in the arena with you. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite, ambitious I'm, I'm young ish for my role I am a uh, female and so there's been times where I've had to really step outside my comfort zone and push forward um, to, to advance my career and um, that's been tough and if you'd been listening to each and every person's opinion of you as you did that process I think you might shrivel up inside but I really got a lot out of her saying you know what take the feedback from the people who are 
also pushing forward in the arena, making themselves uncomfortable and going for it. And that for someone, I can be a little bit sensitive to criticism and feedback like we all can. And I found that really powerful. Yeah, I, I think that's a superb book. I, I love it, Cindy. That's one of my favorites. And, and I, I really resonated with me, the feedback chapter. One of the bits you just touched on it there was that when you are taking feedback from somebody in the arena and you've got that opportunity, you can feel that sort of, um, those parts of your brain shutting down to either ignore what they're saying and, and say, you know, just, just, just barrier it, block it and, and try and justify it. You're telling your own story in your head to say why they're wrong. And when you spot yourself doing that, stop, take a step back and listen and take it on board. And, and even yeah. to the point where you might not respond at that time, you might actually just say thank you and go back and, 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 and let that resonate. Let you th let yourself think about that and circle. She calls it circling back, doesn't she? Circle yes. back yeah. the next day to have another conversation about it. And I think that's so powerful that if you do want to get better and you are willing to learn, which is educators we've got to be, to be able to take that on the chin and, and to say, you know, okay, thank you. Even if inside you're absolutely boiling, you know, you, you completely disagree with everything they've said, take it on board, go away, write it down, draw it, consider it, talk about it to your sounding board. And, you know, you, then objectively you can, you can make a conversation out of it the next day. I thought that part was just incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, the other one I'm reading at the moment is a book that's been written by Julia Gillard, who was the first female prime minister for Australia. And it's just, it's called Women in Leadership. And it's just got a chapter about all these fantastic, amazing uh, leaders. And Jacinda Ardern's a bit of a, a favorite of mine. And my poor old dad absolutely can't stand her. So he'll be laughing when he listens to this. But uh, <laughs> uh, I just, what I really admire about her is nothing to do with her politics because I'm not really based in New Zealand. So I'm not following it at the moment, but I'm really interested in that idea that you can be kind and caring and vulnerable and also a kick-ass leader. And I think that that is something that we're on a bit of an uh, evolution with. I think the kind of old authoritarian style of leader is, is a bit of a thing of the past now. And to try and get that balance right of being caring and being kind, but not being a pushover and still achieving your goals and being driven. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm reading that, it's only just started. I'm nowhere near finished, but I'm interested in how people achieve that balance. Next one then, Cindy, there's some great <laughs> advice there. Um, so what, looking at your Brenny Browns and, look, and looking at your Julie Gillards, what, what have you really then developed as your non-negotiable behaviours that you expect from your team? Um, I guess my first one is always integrity. I don't like people who lie to me. So that's an absolute non-negotiable. Um, I, I, if you make a mistake, I'm not going to shout at you. I'm going to get in the trenches with you and help you out. But if you tell me half truths or you try and hide things from me, uh, we're not going to have a good time together. So that's number one. And I, I need people who are, have integrity. Um, tell me the question again, my non-negotiables as a leader. Um, I do believe in kind of trying to lead from the front, being a hard worker. Um, being there with your staff and showing dedication. Because I think that unless you do that, you're not going to get buy-in. Um, that's a tough question. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not sure. I'm not really a non-negotiable kind of person. I'm quite negotiable. Hey, <laughs> so it's I'm quite interesting, flexible. Cindy. <laughs> we, we, did have, we did have a guest on that suggests that is non-negotiable was to have non-negotiables, which was a very interesting topic in itself. <laughs> My brain hurts. But, <laughs> okay, and then does I mean you've been at Patterner, you, you've been you've been away back to Australia, you've come back. Does does leaving a legacy matter to you? Absolutely, I think that legacies are really sort of under underdeveloped area of practice because uh, to me, it's linked to feeling like you're part of something bigger than yourself. And uh, I think that's what I was most proud of during my time and when I built the swimming program at Bangkok Patana was that I created almost like a little family and those kids wanted to be involved. They would train hard for me. 
their parents were engaged and involved and used to call themselves the Orange Army and still do to this day. And, uh, you know, developing little badges that used to go, get sewn on their shirts that showed year after year what their representative honours had been and then celebrating where our alumni have ended up and staying in touch with them and bringing them back into the fold. And now we've got several of our academy programs at Bangkok Partner really going down that route and trying to keep the kids really connected and feeling like part of something bigger than themselves. And that's beyond graduation as well. Um, I think that I don't think about leaving a personal legacy. I'm not after the Cynthia Dare Memorial anything, but I want to leave behind a legacy where kids remember being part of the Bangkok Patana family and the Bangkok Patana, whether that's the Tiger Shark swim team or the Tigers Football Academy or our gymnastics group, that they look back on that and go, oh, that was, that was really special. And those people are still part of my life. I'd like to think that that's how those kids will feel when they look back. And that kind of comment is why you're in education and that's the, the right kind of way of looking at it for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. That, that's been incredible to listen to. Um, uh, quite a journey and some really insightful opinion and perceptions on, on different aspects of mental health, transferable skills, the values, and, and, and really what children are, are trying to achieve through sport. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, guys. I've really enjoyed it. Cheers, guys. Uh, Search Infinite Leaders live on YouTube and IGTV, and we're also pleased to announce we're on all popular podcasts now, so check us out on Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, etc or at theinfinitelearners.com. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you next time.